Welcome, everyone. Uh, the new webinar for Toronto Agile community for um, today, May 16. Uh, as we have promised to you, we're going to bring uh, new people, new conversation, new topics every month. And this month, uh, we're talking about self-managing teams. And we brought our uh, guest, Steve Hollier, that is joining us all the way from Switzerland. A neutral country, I guess that's why um, self-managing fits well uh, where he is. Uh, quickly, a uh, little uh, about the webinar today. Um, so, some housekeeping rules, just to make sure. Uh, looks like our technology is working. We have tested. If you are seeing any issues, uh, try to make sure that you can log on, log off or try another browser or um, or another audio uh, device. Uh, everyone is on mute to make sure that uh, recording doesn't have noises. And if you have question, please use them on the question box that you have all available and bring the questions there. Steve uh, is open to answer your questions during, so you don't have to wait until the end. So we can have a conversation as we go along. We also have, um, I believe, a special guest, Ellen Grove, that is one of the uh, partners of Steve on the story that he will tell today, and she might, uh, she might participate um, a little bit on this. Before we go any further, we want to thank our sponsors. Uh, you can see here our gold sponsors and our silver sponsors. They are the ones that support our community. Toronto Agile community, they are the ones that support our events. And without them, we wouldn't be able to bring um, events like this to you. So thank you, sponsors. Well, uh, a little bit about Steve. I know Steve from Agile Circles. Uh, I see him on conferences because he's far away from Canada. But uh, recently, I had a, a chance to work with him uh, preparing the the, the program for the Agile 2018, uh, the collaboration, the culture and team um, uh, track. So it was really uh, another sign of, um, of confirming that Steve is someone that is very much uh, attached and very much um, uh, invested in building teams that collaborate, that bring uh, different ideas together, that love to work together and that um, create uh, great products. So I am very happy to have Steve today to join us and to bring uh, the experience that he, he has had with, uh, it's a fun story, you're gonna see it. I do a lot of work with small web development agencies who uh, are developing applications and releases for the web. They release frequently and they change customers all the time. And when you, when I'm talking to a manager or an owner of a web agency, they often say to me, they would love for their teams to be self-managing. And they say their teams are not self-managing, managing. And that's what they would love for them to be. Can I help them with that? And on the other hand, I work with a lot of big banks, so it's exactly the opposite. Small agencies are big banks, and there the managers are often asking me uh, how they can appropriately manage uh, information so that the team is able to do their job. And in the end, I think both of the questions are opposite sides of the same coin. They would like to know what's the best way to help teams self-manage, or the maybe the more popular agile word for that is self-organize. So my question for them and for you today is, do your teams understand their project, their project's management context? And do you want to unlock your team's power to self-manage? Because if you are looking to unlock your team's power to manage themselves, then you're going to need the keys to self-management. And I think their project management context context is often the missing key. So I'm going to focus that on that today.
excuse me, I lost my train of thought there just for a second. Um, what we're going to talk about is are the liftoff keys to helping teams self-manage. And of the three liftoff keys to helping teams self-manage, I'm going to focus on context because, as I said, I think that's the one we're often missing. Uh, so if you want the keys to self-managing teams, I am Steve Hoyer, and I'm here to say don't forget about the context. We mentioned that Ellen Grove is on the line because Ellen and I actually created this talk together. Uh, and when we delivered it, it was called from kickoff to liftoff, but uh, I'm presenting it to you today with very few modifications. Uh, and it's just great uh, because Ellen is part of the Toronto community. It's, it's just great to see how things go around the world and come back again. Oh, okay, what's going on there? Let's get started. I would like to talk to you about the um, three liftoff keys to helping your teams self-manage. But before I even do that, I want you to meet the Yardbirds. The Yardbirds were a team that I was working with uh, at a company called Westenwalder. Now, before we go any further, I need to let you know this is a true story, and the events that are depicted here took place in 2015. At the request of the survivors, the names have been changed out of respect for, well, out of respect for the living, the rest is told exactly as it occurred. So there, hopefully there is no identifying details in this story, but uh, this story is 100% unbelievably true. So the Yardbirds were in trouble. We were in the middle of a planning meeting. Uh, their coach had asked me, or their, their manager had asked me to come to their planning meeting to do a little bit of coaching. And as we were working through the estimates, uh, the estimation phase of the planning meeting, I noticed that one of the team members named Tammy was becoming more and more visibly upset. Um, until finally, Tammy stood up and tears streaming down her face said, I just don't understand where this is coming from. These estimates are coming out of nowhere. The math libraries, how are we ever going to get those written? This is, this is uh, unbearable and I'm ready to quit. And just as soon as Tammy finished, Justin, who was the PO, stood up and tears were streaming down his face as well. And he said, I've had enough. Nobody on this team appreciates what I'm doing. And I actually turn in my resignation right now. And before anybody could react, Paul, who was the newest team member, had been hired one week ago stood up and said, well, I am tired of these meetings that go nowhere. I don't want to attend another meeting with this group until we figure out how to have a meeting that works. And then Travis, the boss said, well, Steve, could you create a nice coaching activity to help us close this meeting? Ha. Yeah, <laughs> that was a challenge. Um, so here we were, a team in disarray. The Yardbirds were very much in trouble, and we didn't know what to do. We did leave the meeting for that day. And that's um, an introduction to what we're talking about today. We're talking about the keys for successful self-managing teams. And uh, we're talking about the liftoff keys. Now, if you want to know what liftoff itself is, uh, liftoff uses systems thinking and lightweight agile charting to get a team off 
to a powerful start. Now, the good news is for a team that hasn't gotten off for to a powerful start, it's never too late to do your liftoff. Uh, and we will see towards the end of this presentation, there's many places where you might use a lift liftoff uh, besides at the beginning or at the start of your team, uh, which is what we were going to do with the Yardbirds. Now, a lot of this material comes out of the book Liftoff, the second edition by Diana Larson and Ainsley Neese. So I want to let you know about that up front. And since I've been throwing these terms around, liftoff keys, uh, systems thinking, I bet you guys would like uh, an overview of liftoff. If you're following along, you may want to take your notebook or a piece of paper, and I'm going to ask you to think for just a moment and think about all the things that you need to put in place to start off a new team or to launch a new project. And quickly, while we're while we're talking, just jot down this list and we'll call it the inception activity. See how many you can think of while we're talking. And I'll continue telling you the story about the yard, the story of the Yardbirds. The next day at lunch, I was meeting the, their boss, the Yardbirds boss, Travis, and Travis was not happy. He was talking about how he has worked with this team now for many months. They just simply don't get it. They probably don't have the skills to get the job done. And um, they probably don't have the skills to get the job done. And they simply are not capable of understanding his vision. That's what Travis says. Uh, and Travis is not very happy about this situation because it's his bonus is riding on the team having a successful, uh, delivering a successful result at the end of their first release. So he sees his bonus in the line and he is not sure he wants to keep uh, any of these good for nothing team members on the job. So Travis, I say to him, what if we take some time to help the team understand your purpose? Of course, he interrupts. I've spent so much time talking to them about my vision. They don't get it. I said, well, okay, well, let's, let's just think about taking a day to talk about the purpose talk about their team alignment, and then spend a lot of time talking about their project management. Because uh, from what I'm hearing, the team doesn't understand their project management context. Yeah, Travis told me that he didn't have time for this. It's hard to find this budget. Uh, and we just needed to go right into our first release planning, our first big room release planning for the first um, uh, release cycle for the next quarter. And that's how we left it. Now, I started doing some quick thinking and I thought if I'm going to facilitate the big room planning, then I'm going to sneak a lift off in there because I think that's what we need to do to get the team off to a good start. And above all, the thing I didn't want to forget was context. Now, I would like to talk to you about the elements of an Agile Charter. Those are the three keys to um, successful uh, self-managing teams. And in that charter, according to the liftoff framework from Diana and Ainsley, the three keys are your purpose. The team needs to understand their purpose so that they can work towards a vision. Alignment, this is how the team understands who they are and how they can work together. And then finally, 
their context, which is the team's, I like, I'm starting to call it the team's project management context. This is the part uh, where the team needs to understand how it fits into the larger organization so that it is able to manage itself. If you have these three elements in place, you need one more thing, and that's the sponsor spark. Um, I believe most teams have a sponsor, someone that gets the team started. And in order to understand the elements of purpose, alignment, and context, we do need that spark from the sponsor, the initial vision um, that the sponsor sets uh, and perhaps then uh, works through the product owner to uh, maintain, but we always want to have the sponsor spark. I was able to uh, spend some time with Travis talking to him about the new, the next release planning. And at that point, what I was asking him about was his sponsor spark. What was his vision? Yes, he had told the team many times. I'd heard him tell the team his vision as well. And to tell the truth, I could not understand his vision. He had a very hard time articulating it. I can say that because I've changed the names and you don't know who he really is. He had a really hard time articulating that vision. So what I was doing was sitting with him and helping him articulate his vision so we could take that into the release planning. Those are the elements of an Agile Charter. And you may notice that each of the three elements of an Agile Charter are broken down further into three components. So the purpose is broken down into vision, mission, and mission test. Now, at least in the liftoff framework, the definition of vision is something big, how the world is going to be a better place when this project is finished, the whole project. The, when the product is delivered, how is the world going to be a different place? Whereas the mission is what is our team doing on this particular planning horizon to get closer to that vision? So if our planning horizon was a release, the mission would probably be the release goal. And finally, the purpose is made up of mission tests, which is essentially how you know if you're on mission or if you've uh, steered your ship completely off course. So mission tests are like acceptance criteria and things like that. Purpose then is made up of those three components, vision, mission, and mission test. Alignment is also made up of um, three components and the alignment is how you, uh, how you establish unity on the team, how you build trust on the team, you create the environment for collaboration to happen and you create the environment that people want to commit. And to do that in the alignment phase, you're talking about things like the core team, who's on the team and who's not. That's very important to know. Simple rules for team behavior. Simple rules are broader than working agreements. Simple rules are how we are with each other. Uh, when the unexpected happens, what is our uh, what are our essential rules for knowing how to behave? And finally, our working agreements, which helps us know how to work together. Those are the elements of alignment. And then finally, we get to the elements of context. When we get to context, we're under trying to understand the systems. Um, how we're supported in the system, how we operate in the system. And we really need to understand what our opportunities are as well as our risks. And the three components of context that we care about, and we're going to get into each of these three deeper. I'm going to talk to you about some tools that you can use for each of these three parts of context. The three parts of context are understanding the boundaries and interaction. Where are the team boundaries? and how do the how do members of the team interact across boundaries? We need to understand the committed resources that are available to the team to complete their mission. And the context phase is a good time to understand the perspective analysis. What are the opportunities and what are the risks? 
Those are the elements of an Agile Charter, purpose, alignment, and context. Now, um, excuse me. I think teams do okay with purpose, and that may be because we taught the product owner a little bit about purpose. And so somebody on the Scrum team, the product owner is doing their best to look after the component of purpose. And we taught the um, Scrum Master just enough about alignment that we have somebody looking after the very basics of alignment. And then we ignored all of the project managers who actually understand all of these elements of context and it's in the project manager skill to manage these elements of context. And I don't know why we ignored the project managers. Perhaps it's because there's no official role for them on the Scrum team. And I hope that in your organization, you haven't ignored the project managers, but what we're going to be talking about today is a way to take those project management skills and bring them into the team so that the whole team is able to participate with the experts, the project managers, in managing their context. Yeah, unfortunately, context is the element that we almost always forget. But let's do something about that. Now, if you made your list of your inception activities, the things that you would do at the beginning of a project, uh, to make sure the project got off to a good start. You have a list of activities that might be candidates for this Agile chartering or this liftoff phase. And I wonder if you look down your list, if you can see which elements belong to purpose, which elements belong to alignment, and which elements belong to context. So if you have time while you're listening, you might just want to mark those down. And as you've identified your activities from the list of activities, uh, and dis and group them into purpose, alignment, or context, I would ask, have you covered all the elements? And what might be missing? What would you do to add that? Artie, I think I would love to hear if there's any questions. I don't know at this point that there are. No questions so far. I think everyone is enjoying your story. <laughs> you think? <laughs> yeah, this is a story, quite a story. Somebody told me I should tell happy stories, and, and, and uh, well, this is one of those that didn't start so happy anyway. <laughs> uh, but it's fun. I think it's fun to tell. Okay. All right. Well, if there's no questions, uh, let me um, start talking to you about what happened next. We, um, about a week passed, uh, the, the uh, boss Travis had created a draft version of his mission, of his vision and a draft version of his mission for the release we were working on. And he was working with the product owner to do that. And he also drafted some mission tests that he thought make sense. So when we got into the room, before we even started talking about the purpose, I asked the group, how do you want to be together today? So instead of lifting off the entire next release, at this point, I was really concentrating on lifting off the day because I needed to know how we could, what we needed to put in place right now so that we could actually get to the end of the day without everybody being in tears. Um, so I asked, how do you want to be with each other today? And that's when another team member, Jamarcus, uh, spoke up and said, oh, more of this touchy feely stuff, I guess. And well, I just ignored that. And, um, pretty soon, uh, Tammy said, I would like us to respect each other. Justin agreed. Travis had leaned on him. He had turned in his re resignation. Travis had leaned on him just a little bit to at least get through the release planning. And we're hoping that once we get through the release planning, uh, he's actually going to um, not resign. 
Paul had some more choice words for us about um, not wanting to waste time. So we took all those notes and um, then we had uh, just enough agreements in place that we thought we could get to the end of the day. I asked Travis to present his draft vision, which he did. It was written on a flip chart. And then I asked the team to begin rewriting that vision. And the team's first response was, why would we do that? Uh, it's already written here. And, you know, I just invited them to give it a try. Took them about 15 minutes to get started, but eventually Paul stood up and walked over to the flip chart and said, well, you know, I don't really understand this word here. He made a little change. And then everybody said, yeah, that's good. We can, we can understand that vision. But I asked them to look again and suddenly Jamarcus said, well, actually I'm, I'm kind of not understanding this whole phrase. And pretty soon the whole team was up at the flip chart working with Travis uh, rewriting or, or refining that vision. So after about 20 minutes, well, okay, it took longer, about 40 minutes, we had a vision that people were starting to understand. People were able to ask Travis uh, what he meant in a way they'd never been able to ask it. I was actually starting to understand his vision too, because um, I'm, unfortunately, Part of the issue here was is the team was having hard, Travis was having a hard time articulating his vision in a way that the team could understand. But now we were working together so that the team was able to understand the vision. We moved on and did the same thing with the mission. And then we did again, the same thing with the mission test. So by lunchtime, the team was working together and the first time uh, in a long time, had a common understanding of their vision, and they had enough alignment to get through the rest of the day. Um, and so we were off to a good start. After lunch, I warned the team, now we're going to be looking at context, which sounds a bit boring, and the whole team kind of groaned, but we went and had a good lunch, and then we came back. So now we're getting to what I Think we're all here for, and that's to talk about context. What about the context? There's a little bit of background. Alignment looks at the core team, and in the uh, a lot of different approaches to system thinking, especially human system dynamics. We know that the, the core team is made up of a group of individuals. Uh, individuals um, have, are individuals uh, relate to each other. They have, individuals have similarities and differences. Often a lot of the differences don't matter, but some differences are very significant. And when these individuals are together in the container of the team, they're forming a team. And that's what we're looking at creating with the alignment. However, as I think everybody realizes, everything we do seems to have a fairly fractal nature. And you can zoom out from the level of the team to where you're looking at many teams that are all forming the greater whole. So our organization is in a sense an organism made up of smaller units which are the teams and then of course the teams contain the individual members what we want to do and we're one of the first things we might want to do when we're talking about context is to talk about the boundaries and interactions how does one team understand where its boundaries are and how does it interact outside of its team container to work with other parts of the organization. And of course, early in the days of an, a new Agile team, and of course before Agile, I think we were often relying on a network of managers and project managers to do this. But to get the really great results that people promise with Agile, what we're trying to do is give the team the ability 
to understand those boundaries and manage their own interactions. And to do that, they need some information, which is often missing for the team. Because, of course, we do forget about context. Now, if you're making notes, uh, I would like you to think again about how you might identify the most interesting stakeholders in your world. So my question is just basically, who is the most interesting stakeholder in your world? And if you think of the most interesting stakeholder, that's somebody outside of the team in your world, and write that down, you might then say, yes, and who's the next most important or most interesting? Who's the, who is the next most interesting stakeholder in your world? And that way you might begin thinking of your own project and creating a list of stakeholders as I continue telling the story of the Yardbirds. Uh, Steve? After, yes? So um, Devjit is asking a question. He says, don't you feel this is how it usually works for the teams? It's that um, creating that, that diverse group and you go from storming, norming, performing, like forming, storming, norming, performing. Um, it, it, isn't it, it it's feeling similar? Uh, yeah, sure, sure. Um, what, we're, what we're doing here is setting up the, 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 um, setting up the environment, the conditions, we're creating the conditions so that the team's able to storm, norm, form, perform. So I'm, I've got, I always get those out of order. Um, we're, we're creating those conditions and, and in other parts of the world, people might be lucky enough that this is happening very smoothly. Um, what, I, what I'm finding with the people I work with is that uh, people throw a, a bunch of people in the room and say, okay, now, now go through your stages and be a team uh, without putting a lot of uh, thought into creating the conditions for the team to succeed. Mm -hmm. Well, he also thinks he's the most interesting person as a PM on the team. So. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I'm sure. Yes, and yes, and who's the next most interesting person? Okay. Okay. <laughs> yeah, I think I think I, I I really I envy the people for for whom this is is something that happens all the time. This is how it should happen every time, and I encounter so often because of there's not enough time or or people um, there's no one putting the focus on doing these activities. We're just not creating those conditions for this to happen smoothly, and so it takes a long time and. If you miss out setting these things up in the beginning, you'll probably spend a lot of time in retrospectives later trying to fix those things you missed. So eventually you might get it, uh, but you might it might take quite a while to um, get this through the retrospective. Uh, whereas if we can create these conditions as the team is getting started, uh, then we can focus on um, higher impact changes in the retrospectives, or at least that's my hope. And this is what I also knew about our friends, the Yardbirds. I, because I had been working with them on and off for quite a while by this point, or at least a uh, couple months, I understood, I knew that they kind of had no idea who their stakeholders were. So I posed this question to them. Who is your, who are your most interesting stakeholders. And we began working through an exercise, which, spoiler alert, it's stakeholder mapping, and probably many people on this call understand what that is. We would just be, I, we started asking, who's your most interesting stakeholder? And they were writing uh, their stakeholders down, one, one stakeholder per sticky note. And when we got far enough along, I asked the team to go to the large whiteboard and put a card that represents the team in the center and then start placing the names of stakeholders around that center in relation to 
the team. So the more interesting stakeholders or the stakeholders that were having a bigger effect on the team or on which the team had more dependencies were closer and the stakeholders that were less present for the team were, were farther away. And as we were doing this, the different team members like Demarcus and even Justin said, uh, were saying things like, oh, yeah, I forgot about this person. I forgot, about yes, of course, the folks in accounting, uh, do we, are our stakeholders, we have relationship with those and started to identify who these, who these people were. Uh, and when we were finished, we, I stood back and I said, is, is everybody there? Looked complete to me from everything I knew, it looked complete. Everybody was not in agreement. Travis was very excited. Yes, we've got it, we've got it. And then Bill, who doesn't say very much, he hasn't shown up in the story before. Bill, who doesn't usually say very much, says, well, what about Mr. Hack? So what? And everybody else goes, oh yes, of course, Mr. Hack. And I'm going, who, what, who's Mr. Hack? And uh, Bill says, you know, Mr. Hack, he's the only one that can run the build script. But I've never met Mr. Hack. Oh yeah, he's not on our team. He sits down in the ops department and he's always very busy. And um, you know, if we ask him, he may be able to adjust the build script in a couple weeks. But and he's the only one that can run the build script. And I thought, well, yeah, I think we better put Mr. Hack on a sticky note. And that names have been changed, and maybe I'm giving too much away. His name was Mr. Hack, actually, and um, or his nickname, not his real name, of course. And um, so we, we put a note on the sticky and put that on the board for Mr. Hack. Now that is information that was going to be missing for a long time from this team until we did this, info, or people knew, but we hadn't surfaced it. And then I did make a note to talk about this again when we came to our perspective analysis. So, as I said, spoiler alert, we're here to the spoiler. What we were doing was stakeholder mapping, which is, I think, something people are very familiar with. Here's a picture of stakeholder mapping that comes right out of the liftoff book, where, where the team Firefly, in this case, is in the middle, and uh, the different roles are written on stickies around the side. In addition to placing the team and the stickies, there's lines drawn to show how the interactions work. What is requested from the stakeholder and what is given to the stakeholder. So what you want to do um, in stakeholder mapping is create the fullest description of the team's boundary and how they cross that boundary to the greater whole. And you want to, uh, with that representation, be able to represent how team members can decide what's in and what's out of the team scope of work. So we're taking that decision, which is often at a project management or even uh, either a project manager, product owner level, and giving the team enough information that they can participate in that scope of work discussion. And again, I think stakeholder mapping is something that many, many, many agile coaches do. And because it's so familiar to us, I think we often kind of just don't do it because everybody's got this. And what I find over and over again, that it is actually very important to visualize this, to surface this information, to uh, help everybody have the same vision of the system um, so that they can understand their boundaries and their act and interactions. That's basically the stakeholder map. And like I said, I prepared this, uh, uh, Ellen, Ellen Grove and I prepared this presentation, the original instance of this presentation and delivered it together. So I know that Ellen's on the line and I just wondered if, uh, Ellen, if you had any experiences with stakeholder mapping you wanted to share. Sorry, now I'm unmuted. Um, <laughs> I was just going to say, in, in recent experiences, whenever I've done this with a team, it seems like a really common sense thing, but it's been really eye-opening to get everybody together with half an hour and a big sheet of flip chart paper, because you discover that you have many more stakeholders than you think you did, for one thing. Um, and when you start to map up the interactions about uh, what 
you know, what do people need from us and what do we people need from them? Patterns emerge when you see it this way that weren't clear as you're just getting things done day to day. And it's a really big aha moment for the team to invest. You can do this really quickly, 30 minutes, 45 minutes. And it gives the team a lot of insight about how they may organize their interactions differently to be more effective. Yeah, thanks. I've, yeah, I've seen that. It's amazing how this seemingly obvious thing uh, brings so much value. Uh, Ellen, have you been doing uh, using Lego Series Play to create stakeholder maps, or 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 have we only talked about it? Uh, I think we've only talked about using okay. Lego to do that. Actually, I've. It, you could though, because I've used Lego to map out who the users of a system might be, and you could use Lego Serious Play the same way: build a model of who the most important stakeholders are, and create yeah, that. I, I haven't practiced yet, though. Yeah, <laughs> we need to get some practice on that. It's so fun. Um, I've managed to do something similar by for a, in a different context, uh, just by thinking of the stakeholder map and thinking about the Lego Serious Play. So yeah, we've got to do more of that. There's lots of fun ways besides a stakeholders map to do uh, share a uh, stakeholder to do this kind of boundaries interactions representation, but the stakeholders sure a simple, easy one. So now if you were making notes while I go on to tell the next part of the story, if you've listed out who might be the most interesting stakeholder in your um, project with for your team you might just doodle uh, a, a little sh uh, stakeholders map for practice there uh, and basically if you're going to do a stakeholders map you're going to um, brainstorm who will your team connect with during the work and arrange them around arrange those names around the team and then identify the interactions draw arrows to show the inputs and the outputs, label them. I mean, that's that's part of the revelation that comes. And the questions you might want to ask about your stakeholders map is, is everyone that's on this diagram aware of the, their roles? If they are aware, is there a shared understanding uh, of the nature of the transactions? And is there a shared understanding of, of the timing? I mean, so many projects uh, uh, come into a conflict state because uh, of dependencies where two different groups have a different understanding of the timing of what's needed. So this is a way to ask that question. If these stakeholders aren't aware of of their of their the nature of the transaction or the timings, how can the team communicate with them? That's a good conversation to have. And yeah, what does what kind of authority might our team need to be able to deliver? The outcomes and does the team have it or how can the team go about getting it that's the questions you might ask about your stakeholders map now the the next um, component of chartering for context is often identifying your committed resources again this is something that project managers have been taking care of for years and years and years if we're relying on the team to do more and more self-management this is something that uh, project managers can help the teams learn to do uh, for themselves. And um, if we go back to the yard birds, I started asking them, will you have what you need when you need it? How will we have what we need when we need it? And uh, of course, Mr. Hack had already shown up on the whiteboard and so then uh, then it was uh, very easy for Bill to say, well, we need to begin talking with Mr. Heck right away about the needs we'll have from the build script. So that's that was one thing. Um, we began to identify the needs for test data when we would need time on the uh, machines that had the test data uh, in the environments, in the large environments I work in, I don't know how it is with you, ha having access to good test data is often a bottleneck. So we were talking about that. The other thing that was interesting is that Travis felt that uh, several of the team members didn't have the skills to do their job. He had said that when he was ranting to me at lunch, that he just doesn't think Tammy has the skills to do 
her job. And I'm saying this doesn't seem likely to me because I've spoken with Tammy and she's a, she's very skilled at what she does. She also delivers trainings, training other people how to do her job. So I think she has the fluency and the skills to do her job, but I'm not sure she has the exact skills that she needs for this, the way this job is changing. So part of this asking, will we have what we need when we need it, is I started asking them what kind of training what kind of skills will you need to complete this project? And we started also mapping out the skills needed versus the skills that they already had. So that's something we did also in this phase of identifying committed resources. Now, there's many, many ways to identify committed resources, but one way uh, that I could suggest going about it is to draw a timeline. and then you would ask what resources do we need to achieve our mes mission and when i'm saying resources here i'm not talking about people i'm talking about resources like systems and machines uh, the people aspects of the project we talked about when we talked about the stakeholders and also the alignment so now when we're talking about resources uh, we're really talking about the physical resources and that's also a nice thing for the people who say people are not resources. That's not a uh, argument I want to get into, but in this context, people are definitely not resources for the sake of what we're talking about here. Um, you'd want to consider the timings of things. When do you need them? What do you need and when do you need them? And do you have, we've gotten this, we, we might have the stakeholders map already. so. Do you have stakeholders commitment if you don't how will you get these things so if you were to do this for yourself if you think about your own project you might ask yourself these questions what resources does your team need to get the work done draw a timeline from today to the end of your mission that might be your the end of your release and then start putting on your timeline uh, relative to when you will need these things along your journey. And then you could also, that's going across, and then going from top to bottom, you might wanna also prioritize must have, good to have, and nice to have, so that you can focus on the must haves um, first. Again, I think this is another one of those things that seems very obvious, but we often don't take the time to actually draw this out and drawing it out is often a surprising revelation. And the question. Uh, Steve, just um, timing, uh, it's about five minutes to give some more time for questions that are coming. Yes, I realized I looked at my clocks. Thank you for the warning. <laughs> <laughs> well, we're gonna get through this. We're gonna do the last bit quickly. Um, if you have, uh, the questions you might wanna ask about your committed resources is, what resources will the sponsor commit to providing? How will the team get the things they need but don't have? And who needs to be consulted when new resource needs arise? Those are the kinds of questions you would ask about your committed resources. And that takes us to the third component of uh, charting for context, which is perspective analysis. And with perspective analysis, you're looking not just at risk management is something that we're all very used to talking about, but also opportunity management. Um, so when I, again, as I was meeting with the, the Yardbirds and we were, I asked them to identify the significant opportunities. And that took them by huge surprise because the Yardbirds had been talking about all their risks to their project and how their project was gonna fail for weeks and weeks and weeks. And I turned the question around and asked them all the ways the project could succeed. And pretty soon Paul, who remember was the newest in the company, uh, started relating to us how he had done something similar at another uh, job, which, uh, made Tammy remember that there was information in the database at this company that could be used to create some of the opportunities that Paul was talking about. Jamarcus uh, was extremely excited to relate this to some other work he had been doing. Uh, and 
Always Quiet Bill figured out a way to work with, uh, there might be an opportunity to work with Mr. Hack uh, to have a more flexible build script. And the way you might do a perspective analysis that we might suggest is think about your future events, put them on stickies. Uh, what you're trying to do is expose your assumptions about the risks, but also the opportunities. And as I've been saying, you want to be sure to consider the possibilities, the positive possibilities and not just the negatives. If you're gonna do that for yourself, you might want to list all these events and then one option you have is to put them on a grid uh, to put them in quadrants. So the good things that will definitely happen, as well as the bad things that will definitely happen. And then also the opportunities for good things that probably won't happen, as well as the bad things that probably won't happen. And then the question you would ask about that is how do you want to handle those high priority, high impact events? What other events do you want to prepare for? and how we'd be handling those. So these are, th these are again, conversations that the team is not always having and what we're doing here is creating a place for them to have those conversations. Ellen, um, do you have any thoughts about the pers uh, perspective analysis? Uh, just a couple of very quick observations. Uh, one of the things that's really powerful about doing this with the team is that you surface ideas that wouldn't have emerged if, you know, traditionally project managers go off and do the risk analysis. And when you ask the team, you get new information about risks that individuals see that from their point of view, that maybe the wider team doesn't see, which is really cool. I think asking about the opportunities is really important because we always focus on well, what could go wrong? And sometimes it's way more beneficial to focus on what could go really right, because that's what we want to head towards, right? We don't want to just focus on what are we trying to avoid, but it's like, what kind of greatness are we want to, do we want to achieve? And having that conversation up front can set the stage for that to happen. Um, in terms of how to have this conversation, this is something where you can do it with a flip chart and get people to have stickies or something. But this is something where improv activities or using something like story cubes too to prompt people's imagination can really help broaden the input that you get as part of the conversation. If you use anything, pictures, story cubes, Lego, that encourages people to think outside the box a little bit about what could happen, you get richer information than if you just sit down and go, okay, let's think about all the risks we might encounter. Yeah. Yeah, cool. I think, yeah, our, our whole goal here is to surface all that information that that before the managers of the project managers were, were thinking about. Thanks. And it's time to be wrapping it up. And uh, Artie's going to be looking at the, say, telling me that it's time for Q&A. So I just want to review. We've talked about the three elements of the Agile Charter. Those are the three keys to unlocking self-management teams. It's giving the teams enough information that they're actually able to manage themselves. So often when I'm working with my customers, I'm hearing the teams just aren't able to manage themselves, but I'm digging deeper and finding out they actually don't have enough information to be able to manage themselves because somebody's holding on to that, maybe because they think it's so obvious that the team knows and they don't um, in many cases. But the three elements are, again, purpose, alignment, context, and please, whatever you do, don't forget the context. We talked about three tools, three ways to ha start conversations about context. Uh, we looked at conversations about boundaries and interactions, which is the stakeholder map. We looked at committed resources and how to create some conversations around there. And, and we talked about a couple different ways to do perspective analysis. And Ellen brought in the great ideas about using uh, story cubes and Lego. And all of this is detailed uh, in the second edition of the book, Lift Off, uh, with some sample facilitation plans. So if this has piqued your curiosity, I'd recommend picking up that book. I do think I'm just going to look ahead. I do think there's five keys to self-management team, managing teams. We had the three, purpose, alignment, and context. And if you ever invite me back, we might talk about fluency and mastery, which is another missing key. 
And actually another key to leadership is actually leadership. So I think that's something uh, to talk about in the future. Uh, Artie, do we have time for any questions? And then I can finish the Yardbird story. <laughs> Um, well, there is only a question, and I'm guessing it comes from a team that is probably remote because so far you have said that uh, tools to use are flip chart and stickies, but is there any software tools to use for stakeholder mapping? I'm always looking for a good tool, and there is one. Oh, what is it? There, um, I haven't had the need to use it for a while. There is one whiteboarding tool that I really like. Um, Maybe later. So, yeah, when I think I'm going to find it and I, I'm going to tell you later. Uh, I think okay. what's important for the remote teams, yeah, it's a lot harder. What If you're bringing a team together for the first time, I love to say if you can bring them on site, maybe even once a quarter and do some of these things on site. I don't know. That's not always possible. So the other thing that I think with remote teams is to find a way to have these conversations anyway even if it's remote it's probably even more important um and i will let you know about the 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 whiteboarding tool i i like and i would like there to be some more now to finish the story of the yardbirds we did get through that day of chartering we got through that release planning and the yardbirds did go on to deliver a successful release Travis actually got his bonus. He's left the company now, and he's actually working, believe it or not, uh, as a coach somewhere. Um, and uh, he was happy with his bonus. Tammy did not quit, and that would have been a huge change for her because she, she could walk to work, which is something she loved, and she didn't want to have to commute more than an hour each way to another job. So she uh, found happiness in the team. Turns out Justin, uh, our PO, didn't uh, uh, withdrew his resignation as well. And he stayed with the team for several releases. And he eventually has moved on to work for a, a very popular music streaming service. And uh, Jamarcus continues to make uh, connections for the team and uh, Paul is still enjoying meetings that do actually go somewhere and Bill speaking up more often than not because he has uh, there's a place for him to speak up so yeah I think the Yardbirds are going to be okay it's not always perfect but they're going to be okay <laughs> um, I, I have to say thanks to Diana Larson, Ainsley Knees, who wrote the book Lift Off, and Katie Dvorak, who was their editor that gave me permission to use some of the images from the book. I, I also got to write a chapter in the book, and I tell the whole story of the Arbors. I just told the highlights this year. <laughs> so the, the, um, the whole story of the Arbors is in the book, if you get the book. And Katie, actually, another reason I have to say thanks for to her is she gave me permission to publish the whole story on my website, so you can also find it there. And um, again, I'm Steve Hoyer, and you can get in touch with me if you'd like to talk about uh, doing some liftoffs with your teams. You can get in touch with me, and. Um, you can also get in touch with Ellen. And now Ellen is in Canada, so she's close. So if you're looking for somebody to work with you in Canada, uh, Ellen might be a great person to get a hold of. And there's her contact information. And I would love to work with you uh, remotely. And we can put the challenges of remote teams to the test. Okay. Thank you, Steve. Thank you, Ellen, very much. Uh, we are a little bit out of time, but doesn't seem like there are many questions I think you have answered. So uh, on behalf of the Toronto Agile community, we want to thank you for your time. Um, being so late up at night, it's probably midnight uh, where you are right now. And oh. uh, not yet. <laughs> and uh, I am Ardita Karai. I have uh, with me Peter Jakes and Paul Henman, volunteers of the Toronto Agile community. And we want to thank you. We want also to extend uh, our invite for